Hello everyone, welcome to this A-level revision tutorial on the period of dual power between March and October 1917. And we're going to cover quite a lot of ground here from the fall of the Tsar through to the Bolshevik takeover in October. Now the period of dual government began in March 1917 with the fall of the Tsar Nicholas II. And it's useful for us to remind ourselves of what the situation was like in Russia at that point. As you probably remember, the Tsar was pressured to abdicate by his own ministers and the Russian high command, the leading generals of the Russian army. They were concerned that Nicholas was leading the country to defeat in World War I. He was replaced with a provisional government and they were appointed, not elected, by the Provisional Committee of the Duma. They sat in the Tauride Palace in Petrograd. The same building was also home to the newly reformed Petrograd Soviet. Now this was a council of workers and soldiers representatives. You might remember the Soviets had appeared first during the 1905 revolution but were quickly crushed by the Tsarist regime. They reappear from late February 1917 onwards in every town and city in Russia. The Petrograd Soviet was the most important and powerful Soviet. Now at this point there was no guarantee that the revolution against the Tsar would succeed. At this point in time there was every chance that the Tsar might find and return with loyal troops and carry out a counter-revolution, re-establishing his authority. And it's important to bear this in mind because it really influences the actions of the key politicians in those early months of dual power. It's also worth remembering that the revolution on the streets did not end with the fall of the Tsar. In fact, that revolution was just beginning. There was chaos, there was looting, and there was violence. But there was also development of political consciousness among the masses, and we'll see that develop in the course of this session. Now we call this the period of dual power because there were not one, but two bodies exercising influence in Russia. First of all, the Provisional Government. It was chosen by the Provisional Committee of the Duma. That meant that it was not elected by the Russian people. And that meant that its authority was often questioned. However, it did have some powerful backers in Russian society. The Army High Command and also Russia's wartime allies, Britain and France who recognised the provisional government as the official government of the Russian Empire. It was made up of liberals, mostly cadets, but also Octoberists. There was just one socialist to begin with, and that was Alexander Kerensky, the SR. Now, as the official government of Russia, on paper, it had some key powers, like the power to make laws, to raise taxes, and to deal with foreign policy. The provisional government saw itself as a temporary government, a caretaker if you like, and therefore unable to take the long-term decisions for Russia's future. Those would be taken by a constituent assembly, which would be elected by the people, and it was the provisional government's job to organise elections to that body. The provisional government also wanted to continue the war, and in fact it wanted to continue fighting the war aggressively to win territory for Russia. In terms of the big questions concerning Russia's future, members of the provisional government saw that they had no authority to make those decisions, so they wanted to leave those decisions to the constituent assembly, and that included the question of land reform. Finally, we must also remember that most of the members of the provisional government wanted to maintain 
the integrity of the Russian Empire. And that meant heading off or preventing any attempts by national minorities to break away or exercise more autonomy over their own affairs. And although many of the liberals within the provisional government shared the same basic aims, it's important to remember that there were factions, particularly within the cadet party. And the cadets on the left of the party wanted to carry out more social reform and were more willing to accept some decentralisation of power, greater independence for national minorities. Now let's turn to the Petrograd Soviet. That was formed by elected representatives of the workers on the 27th of February 1917. So it had a good claim to be their legitimate voice. It was later joined by soldiers' representatives a couple of days later who wanted to have their voice heard on the Soviet too. Now it was made up of representatives of the workers and soldiers and sailors. And that made it quite a big body. It was difficult to make decisions in a body this big. So an inner executive committee was formed, and that was made up of moderate socialists to begin with, Mensheviks and SRs. These were predominantly not workers, but members of the intelligentsia. Now, although it wasn't the official government of Russia, it had huge influence through it through its control of the workers and soldiers. Indirectly, it could control the railways, the factories, the power supplies and the soldiers of the Petrograd garrison. Ultimately, the Petrograd Soviet could bring the country to a halt and bring down the provisional government, if it so chose, by sending workers out on strike. However, the Soviet chose not to do this. It chose a policy of cooperating with the provisional government and agreed to go along with continuing the war. However, there is a key difference here. The majority of socialists in the Soviet backed the idea of a defensive war, a war fought to protect Russia's borders, not to gain territory. In terms of land reform, the Petrograd Soviet in its early days shared the same policy as the provisional government. Most of the moderate socialists agreed that the question of land reform had to be left to the constituent assembly. However, they were willing to make more concessions to national minorities and they were more willing to allow national minorities some form of self-government. And as we'll see, that's exactly what happens in the Ukraine. It's also worth remembering that there were party factions within the Petrograd Soviet too. And although the majority of the Soviet in those early days were moderate socialists, those moderate socialist parties had their more extreme factions. The Menshevik internationalists and the left SRs were far more radical than the rest of their parties, and they opposed the war altogether. Now, as we've seen, the Soviet Executive Committee was dominated by leaders from the moderate socialist parties, the Mensheviks and the SRs. Their influence over workers and soldiers gave them huge power to control railways, factories and communications, and they could have used this power to bring down the provisional government and take power for themselves. And yet they chose not to. Why was this? Well, there were three main reasons. The first is connected to their Marxist ideology. Mensheviks and SRs believed that Russia was not yet ready for a proletarian revolution. According to the writings of Marx, they expected Russia to go through the bourgeois stage of the revolution first. So they expected to see a period of parliamentary democracy in Russia, during which time industrialization would happen and the working class would grow in size. 
only when the working class was a majority would Russia be ready for the proletarian stage of the revolution. Secondly, they feared counter-revolution. They believed that if the Soviet took power, the Russian high command would never tolerate that and the leaders of the Russian army would return from the front with loyal troops and carry out a counter-revolution. They would crush the Soviet and establish some form of authoritarian rule, perhaps reinstalling the Tsar. And thirdly, we should also remember that the leaders of the Mensheviks and the SRs were unwilling to take power because they feared the masses. They doubted their ability to control what was happening on the streets. And remember, there was a great deal of chaos, violence, looting, and breakdown of order in late February, early March. And they doubted their ability to restore order. So they were content to sit back and allow the provisional government to handle that. So here's a timeline showing the period of dual power between March and October of 1917. For the purposes of this tutorial, we're going to divide it into three phases. The honeymoon period, the summer months during which the provisional government struggled to solve the key issues facing the country, and lastly, between August and October, the Bolshevik seizure of power. As we work through this, it's useful to keep an eye on some emerging trends across the period. Firstly, the provisional government lost support across all sections of society, not just among the masses, but also among its traditional supporters, the middle classes and the landowners. The second trend we will see is that workers, soldiers and peasants became increasingly radical in their demands. The third trend we'll see is that the cadets in the provisional government became increasingly conservative, less and less willing to tolerate reform and more and more willing to protect the interests of the powerful and wealthy in society. We'll also see that the moderate socialists became increasingly discredited in the eyes of the people they claim to represent. And the last trend we'll see is that the Bolshevik support increased. However, this is not a steady process. Bolshevik support waxes and wanes at different stages. We need to keep an eye out for that. So we'll turn first to the honeymoon period, those first two months of the period of dual power. And there are three key events to look out for here. Order number one, the Milukov note, and Lenin's April theses. During the honeymoon period, the provisional government introduced some major reforms. It arrested the Tsar, his ministers, officials and hated police force and disbanded the Okhrana, the secret police. It introduced a political amnesty, releasing political prisoners and allowing radicals in exile to return to the country. It granted freedom of speech and freedom of the press and abolished the death penalty. It also introduced improvements for workers, giving them the right to form trade unions and factory committees along with an eight-hour working day. And lastly, it also promised to arrange elections for a constituent assembly which would draw up a new constitution for Russia. These reforms were hugely significant. They created a huge amount of goodwill towards the provisional government from all social classes. The reforms are also very revealing. They reveal that the cadets who dominated the provisional government were capable of carrying out radical political and social reforms. In fact, by the time these reforms are introduced, Russia has been transformed into the most democratic society in Europe. 
the reforms also reveal that cooperation between workers and employers was possible in these early months. The eight hour working day was one of workers' key demands and employers agreed to it. The reforms are also important because they allowed radicals the freedom to operate. Radicals began to return to Petrograd from exile and the first two Bolshevik leaders to return, Kamenev and Stalin. By passing these reforms, the provisional government also deprived itself of the means of coercion. By that I mean by disbanding the Okhrana and the police and by getting rid of the death penalty, the provisional government made it much harder for itself to deal with radical opponents. The first key move made by the Soviet during this period was the issuing of Order No. 1. Soldiers of the Petrograd garrison went to the Soviet and demanded to be represented there. The moderate socialists leading the Soviet agreed to this and they issued Order No. 1 which said Firstly, soldiers should elect their own committees and each one would send a representative to sit on the Soviet. Secondly, these soldiers' committees would control the weapons and ammunition, not the officers. The Soviet also decreed that soldiers should only obey the instructions of the provisional government if they did not conflict with the instructions of the Soviet. Finally, Order No. 1 also abolished all formal army titles. Now, these instructions were hugely significant. Firstly, they're very revealing. They reveal to us that even in those early days, the moderate socialist leaders were under pressure from the soldiers who had a clear idea of what they wanted. They had clear goals and were able to bring this pressure to bear on their socialist leaders. Secondly, in issuing this order, the Soviet undermined discipline in the army and undermined the provisional government's influence over the soldiers. So on the one hand, the Soviet was willing to cooperate with the provisional government, but at the same time, it was undermining the provisional government. Finally, this order reveals exactly how weak the provisional government was. The order weakened the provisional government's ability to keep order and fight the war because the provisional government was relying on the soldiers, particularly the soldiers of the Petrograd garrison, to do this. The provisional government's honeymoon period of cooperation with the Soviet began to come to an end with the publication of the Milyakov Note. Now remember, moderate socialist leaders in the Soviet supported the idea of a defensive war only, whereas cadets in the provisional government preferred to fight an aggressive war to win territory, particularly to grab a slice of the Ottoman Empire's territory or modern day Turkey. Now, Milyakov, the cadet foreign minister of the provisional government, wrote privately to the Allies, Britain and France, promising to play a full role in the war, promising to pursue an aggressive war. And his note was leaked to the press, and when it was published, it outraged moderate socialist leaders and caused protests on the streets. It was outraged that the provisional government was privately continuing to fight an aggressive war. The publication of this note was significant. Firstly, it damaged the provisional government's reputation with the workers and soldiers, and that brought an end to the honeymoon period of goodwill which the provisional government had had from the workers and soldiers in its early days. The note also increased distrust between the cadets and the moderate socialist leaders in the Soviet. And it also leads to a political crisis. The pressure on the streets leads to the resignation of Milyakov and Guchkov, the war minister. 
And that leads to the formation of what we'll call the First Coalition, and we'll come to that a little later. Now, while all this was happening, Lenin returned to Russia and issued his April theses. He's not the first Bolshevik leader to return to Petrograd. Kamenev and Stalin returned first, and in Lenin's absence, they followed the Menshevik line of cooperating with the provisional government rather than taking power for the Soviet. Lenin returned to Russia on a sealed train, and when he arrived, he called immediately for the following. First of all, he called on the Soviet to take power immediately on behalf of the proletariat. He called for an immediate end to the war at any price, and that Russia should sign a separate peace treaty with Germany. He called for immediate land reform and said that the landowners' estates should be given immediately to the peasantry. And he laid out a policy of not cooperating with the provisional government in any way. When Lenin put forward these policies, the Bolshevik Central Committee rejected them as they viewed the policies as far too radical. In fact, they criticised Lenin, believing he was out of touch with the situation in Russia, having been in exile for so long. Lenin, however, won the Central Committee round, partly by his force of argument, and he put forward four key arguments in favour of his policies. Firstly, he argued that the Russian bourgeoisie was too weak to establish a parliamentary democracy in Russia, and that the revolution had already gone beyond the bourgeois stage. The proletariat had already begun to take power, Lenin argued, by creating Soviets. Lenin also argued that the poorer peasants in Russia had a degree of class consciousness and therefore they could be included as part of the proletariat, making it big enough to carry out a revolution. Lenin also argued that the worldwide socialist revolution would start not in the most developed capitalist countries, as Marx had predicted, but in the weakest link in the capitalist chain, and Lenin identified Russia as the ideal starting place for worldwide revolution. Lenin's April theses are hugely important. They became the key slogans and policies of the Bolshevik party. And the two key slogans you need to remember are these, peace, bread and land, all power to the Soviets. Now these policies are important because they had broad appeal to the soldiers, workers and peasants. The second thing worth noting here is that these, uh, these policies made the Bolsheviks easy to distinguish from the other socialist parties, particularly from the Mensheviks. The Bolsheviks were now offering an alternative that no other socialist party was offering. The final thing worth noting here is that this is an example of an occasion on which Lenin adds momentum to events. He plays a key role in driving forward the Bolshevik party, making its policies more radical. The honeymoon period of goodwill towards the provisional government had come to an end by the end of April 1917, and the provisional government, which as we've seen was unelected, held very little authority in the eyes of most Russians. For them, the provisional government would be judged purely on the basis of how well it solved the big problems facing the country, and these problems come to the fore in summer of 1917.
We're going to turn to those now, and in the course of doing so, we'll talk about the First Coalition, the Summer Offensive, the July Days, and the Second Coalition. So on the 5th of May, there's a major change in the makeup of the Provisional Government. We're going to call this change the formation of the First Coalition. Now remember, after the Milyakov note was made public, there was a political crisis for the Provisional Government, and two of its leading ministers, Milyakov the cadet, he was foreign minister, and Guchkov the Octoberist, the war minister, they both resigned. A new coalition government was formed. And that coalition government included five more socialists. Now, in particular, it's worth knowing the names of these two. Chernov, who was a socialist revolutionary, he became agriculture minister. And Seratelli, the Menshevik, became interior minister. That brought the total number of socialists in the provisional government to six. Because remember, Kerensky was also a member of the PG. He was another SR, as we know, and he is promoted at this point from Justice Minister to War Minister. Prime Minister was still Prince Lvov, another cadet. And the coalition government was still dominated by cadets. But make no mistake, from this point onwards... It's very much a coalition between cadets and socialists. This first coalition is hugely significant. By entering the coalition, Menshevik and SR leaders begin to become associated with the policies of the provisional government. And that's going to have a negative impact on their credibility in the eyes of their natural supporters, the workers and peasants. It also gave the Bolsheviks an opportunity to attack or criticise the moderate socialists for selling out to and joining the provisional government. In Lenin's words, he referred to them as those despicable socialists who have sold out to the government. So during the summer of 1917, the provisional government struggled to solve four major problems facing the country. Firstly and foremostly, the problem of continuing the war effort, which underpinned all of the other problems. In this area, the provisional government's solution was to launch a massive propaganda campaign to raise support for the war among the war-weary Russian public. This was largely the work of Alexander Kerensky, who toured the front, delivering patriotic speeches to the soldiers and imitating the poses of the French Emperor Napoleon. Then, in the early days of June, the provisional government launched a massive new summer offensive against the Germans on the Eastern Front. The propaganda campaign met with some success. The middle classes were infused and many signed up for shock battalions to go and fight on the front. However, the campaign did very little to actually raise the morale of soldiers who continued to desert the army. But worse than that, the offensive itself was a disaster. It began to fall apart after just a few days, resulting in the loss of thousands of soldiers and the loss of yet more territory to the Germans. This reflected badly, not just on the provisional government, but also on the socialist leaders of the SRs and Mensheviks, who had joined the coalition government and therefore were associated with this disastrous new offensive. They lost credibility with workers and soldiers for their part in it. And the offensive, as it broke down, triggered an outburst of anger back in Russia. This was centred in Petrograd and took the form of an uprising against the provisional government, which we know as the July Days. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So in this area, 
was huge failure for the provisional government. And looking back with hindsight, it's reasonable to, look, to ask whether the provisional government should have adopted a different approach and perhaps tried to end the war by signing a separate peace. But was there really an alternative? Well, ending the war by making a separate peace might have won the provisional government the support of soldiers, and it might have allowed the provisional government to focus on solving some of its other problems. However, ending the war would likely have caused the provisional government to lose the support of many nationalists across Russian society. And remember, there were nationalists in every social class, including workers. The provisional government would also have lost support from Russia's wartime allies, France and Britain, upon whom the provisional government depended for war loans to prop up the economy. Making a separate peace might also have triggered a counter-revolution. The army generals at Russian high command were determined to win the war. If the provisional government signed a separate peace, they might have returned to Petrograd crush the government and set up some form of dictatorship in order to continue the war effort. Now we're speculating here because we don't know what would have happened had the provisional government tried to make a separate peace with Germany, but as we can see it might well have come with negative consequences. The second major problem faced by the provisional government were the peasants demands for land reform. In this area, the provisional government followed a policy of delaying land reform, asking peasants to wait patiently for the election of the constituent assembly, which would then deal with the land question. One of the socialists who had joined the provisional government in the first coalition, Chernov, the agriculture minister, put forward a compromise position. He suggested letting peasants use the nobles' estates on a temporary basis and the question of land ownership and compensation for the landowners could be sorted later. However, the cadets, who were becoming increasingly conservative through 1917, blocked Chernov's compromise. They were seeking to protect the privilege of the landowners. As a result of following these policies, the provisional government lost a lot of goodwill among the peasants who desperately wanted the provisional government to give them the consent to take the land. The moderate socialist leaders also lost credibility with the peasantry. By joining the coalition government, they were now associated with the provisional government and its lack of land reform. Peasants, meanwhile, continued to seize the land regardless, and the provisional government had no means or force with which it could stop this happening. So they went ahead and seized the land anyway. And this caused frustration among the landowners, who were traditionally supporters of the provisional government, but who became increasingly frustrated that the provisional government was unable to stop the peasants seizing the land. So was there an alternative policy which the provisional government could have followed? Well, it might have permitted peasants to take the land for themselves immediately. And on the one hand, this would probably have earned them a good deal of goodwill among the peasants. But there would have been drawbacks too. Following such a policy would have required the provisional government to go against their principles. Remember, the members of the provisional government believed that they lacked the legal authority to do land reform, as they were unelected. Therefore, they would have had to go against that principle to do it. And thirdly, and perhaps more severely, if the provisional government committed to a policy of land reform, the likelihood of disintegration of the army would increase. Peasant conscript soldiers would likely desert the front and head back to their villages to gain the land. This would lead to the breakdown of the army and the loss of the war effort. The provisional government's third problem was the deteriorating economy, most notably the rising inflation and food shortages, which were the key causes of workers' discontent in the cities. The provisional government tried doubling the price of grain to encourage peasants to sell more of it on the markets. However, peasants still had little incentive to sell, 
as there were few manufactured goods in the shops for them to buy. So many peasants continued to subsistence farm, growing just enough for themselves and for their families. As food shortages continued, the provisional government moved to a policy of requisitioning grain by force. This was exactly the same policy as the old Tsarist regime. Sending armed forces into the countryside to take the peasants' grain led to an increase in hostility towards the provisional government from the peasantry. In terms of inflation, the provisional government refused to fix the prices of goods in towns and refused to deal with the profiteers or businessmen who were making inflated profits from the shortages of goods. The failure to deal with these problems had huge consequences. Inflation continued to rise and so too did unemployment. And the relationship between workers and employers continued to break down. Now in the early days when the provisional government first came to power, you might remember that the employers and workers were able to make some compromises. However, that starts to come apart now. Workers are increasingly prone to strikes and factory takeovers and employers are increasingly locking their workers out and making them unemployed. Finally, we should also note that the failure to deal with inflation meant that socialist leaders who had joined the provisional government lost credibility with the workers, who were becoming more radical in their demands. So was there an alternative in this area? The provisional government might have followed a policy of introducing more economic and social reforms in the towns. And that would likely have satisfied the demands of workers who wanted better paying conditions. However, for the provisional government, it might well have led to the loss of support from the industrialists. And also, we should also note that it would have been impossible for the provisional government to deal with the economic deterioration in a meaningful way without first ending the war. And as we've seen, that was not an easy option either. The fourth problem faced by the provisional government were the national minorities' demands for greater independence or autonomy. In this area, Kerensky and the other socialist members of the provisional government made some compromises. They promised greater autonomy to Ukrainian nationalists. However, this caused outrage among the liberals, particularly the cadets, who were moving in a more conservative direction through 1917 and prioritised holding the empire together rather than giving national minorities greater freedom. This led to the second great political crisis of the period. It triggered the resignation of three cadet ministers from the provisional government, followed a few days later by the resignation of the prime minister, Prince Lvov himself. And we'll talk a little bit more later about the formation of the second coalition after this. So was there an alternative? The provisional government might have refused all demands for autonomy from the national minorities. However, was this a realistic policy? The provisional government lacked the necessary force to impose its control over those minorities, so it's unlikely that it would have been able to carry out its will. Having failed to solve its problems, the provisional government faced an armed uprising during the July days. The uprising was driven by two underlying causes. Firstly, the workers' economic suffering, and secondly, the Petrograd garrison's fear of being sent to the front. The trigger for the uprising was the failure of the summer offensive launched by Kerensky in June. Workers, soldiers and Kronstadt sailors all of whom were becoming increasingly radical in their demands through summer of 1917, marched to the Soviet and demanded that the socialist leaders take power. Now Lenin was absent from this uprising, but there is evidence that mid-ranking Bolshevik leaders were actively involved in encouraging the protests. The provisional government brought back loyal troops and used them to crush the uprising. In many ways, this is very similar to the way that the Tsarist regime dealt with unrest. The uprising is hugely significant. It's very revealing of how frustrated workers and soldiers felt towards their moderate socialist leaders, who they viewed as 
cooperating with the provisional government by taking part in the coalition. The event itself boosted Kerensky's reputation hugely as he dealt with the uprising successfully. The Bolsheviks, meanwhile, came out of this very badly. They were undermined as a political force. They were accused of being behind the uprising and denounced as being traitors, being paid by the Germans to undermine the war effort. Lenin was forced to flee to Finland and Trotsky was imprisoned. Several Bolshevik newspapers were shut down. It looked like the Bolsheviks were finished as a political force. The event also reveals the limits of Lenin's control over the party and of Bolshevik party discipline. Mid-ranking Bolshevik leaders defied the instructions from the party leadership. The event also reveals to us something more about the nature of the Bolshevik party. It could be very responsive to public opinion and to pressure from below for more radical action. The mid-ranking Bolsheviks who participated in the uprising were responding to pressure from the workers and soldiers for a more radical approach. Later that month, a second coalition government is formed. Now remember, initially the provisional government was dominated by cadets with just one socialist minister, Kerensky. After the Milyakov note created a political scandal, the first coalition was formed. Five more socialists entered the provisional government. Now, when Lvov resigned, and shortly after the July days, a second coalition government was formed, and this one's rather different. Kerensky, whose prestige is high following his successful response to the July days, Kerensky becomes prime minister, so there's now a socialist heading up the provisional government. And although there are many cadets in this second coalition, it's dominated by socialists. Here's our big picture again. In the next phase, we'll look at the Bolshevik seizure of power. There are two major events we'll look at the Kornilov Affair and the Bolshevik takeover in October. The defining event of Kerensky's time as Prime Minister was probably the Kornilov Affair at the end of August 1917. This happened amid a backdrop of rising crime and the breakdown of law and order in the city of Petrograd. Kerensky entered into an agreement with a right-wing conservative army general, General Kornilov. Kerensky agreed to make Kornilov supreme commander of the armed forces, and in return, Kornilov agreed to bring loyal troops from the front to Petrograd to help to restore order. Kerensky's motives appear to have been restoring law and order in the city, and guarding against any future uprisings, especially from the Bolsheviks. General Kornilov appears to have shared Kerensky's desire to restore order and authority in the city. He also wanted to crush the radical socialists, as he did not want them to undermine Russia's war effort. But Kornilov's motives went further than this. He also intended to seize control for himself and set up some form of military dictatorship and it's likely that he wanted to carry out some form of counter-revolution reversing the gains which have been made since the fall of the Tsar in February. When Kerensky got wind of these motives he backed out realising that Kornilov intended to carry out a counter-revolution. As Kornilov began to march towards the city, Kerensky panicked, called for Soviet help to defend Petrograd, and he provided weaponry. Workers and soldiers rallied to defend the city against Kornilov's advance, and Kerensky released Bolshevik prisoners to help coordinate this. The Bolsheviks mobilised the workers and organised the defence of the city 
through their Red Guard paramilitary force. In the event, Kornilov never made it as far as Petrograd. His advance was stopped outside the city and he was arrested. But the event had huge consequences. Kerensky, the provisional government, and the moderate socialists who had joined the provisional government in coalition were thoroughly discredited with workers for having involved themselves in this counter-revolutionary plot of General Kornilov. The event also sped up the breakdown of discipline in the army. Soldiers saw the whole affair as part of a plot by their officers to restore traditional army discipline. They turned against their officers. Kerensky, meanwhile, lost the support of some of the traditional supporters of the provisional government, the officers and middle classes. In their eyes, Kerensky had betrayed Kornilov by backing out of this plan to restore order in the city. And on the back of the Kornilov affair, there is a huge wave of support for the Bolsheviks, who were able to present themselves as the defenders of the city, the defenders of the Soviet, and the defenders of the revolution. Partly as a result of this, the Bolsheviks are elected in huge numbers to Soviets nationwide, including in Moscow and Petrograd, the two most important Soviets in the country. The scene is now set for the Bolshevik takeover of power. By mid-September, Lenin was convinced that the time was right for the Bolsheviks to take power. There are a number of reasons for this. Firstly, the Kornilov affair had discredited Kerensky and the provisional government in the eyes of the workers, soldiers and sailors. It had also demoralised the provisional government's traditional supporters, the liberals and conservatives, who had seen Kornilov as their last hope of restoring order in Petrograd. Lenin judged that this was the right time to seize power, as it was unlikely that any of these groups would come to the defence of the provisional government. Bolshevik support, meanwhile, was at its highest level yet, with the Bolsheviks elected in large numbers to Soviets across the country, and they had also gained a majority on the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets. Meanwhile, the war was continuing, and that was a key driving force behind discontent towards the provisional government. Lenin was concerned that at any moment the provisional government might sign a separate peace treaty with Germany and that would remove one of the key reasons why the provisional government was unpopular. Lastly, Lenin was also aware that elections for the Constituent Assembly were scheduled to happen in November of 1917 and he was determined that the Bolsheviks must seize power from the provisional government rather than the Constituent Assembly. Why was this? Well, remember, the Provisional Government was self-appointed, unelected, formed from the old Duma, and they were seen to represent the middle classes and the landowners. They lacked legitimacy or authority in the eyes of the Russian people. Lenin knew that seizing power from the Provisional Government could be presented as a democratic revolution. The Constituent Assembly would be rather different. It would be elected on a wide franchise and representative of all social classes. It was unlikely that the Bolsheviks would gain a majority on it. The Constituent Assembly itself would be a democratic and legitimate body. Lenin knew that seizing power from the Constituent Assembly would look undemocratic, like a coup or an uprising. So we're going to look now at the events of October 1917, and I'm going to draw out a few things that are really, really important. On September the 12th, Lenin, who was still in hiding in Finland at that point, he wrote to the Bolshevik Central Committee and he urged them to agree to seize power. This is what he wrote. History will not forgive us if we do not assume power now. Otherwise, the Bolsheviks will cover themselves with eternal shame and destroy themselves as a party. History will not forgive us. Now, despite Lenin's persuasiveness, the Bolshevik Central Committee rejected his demands. 
And that's really quite interesting. It demonstrates that Lenin's control of the party is limited at this point. The Central Committee decides not to agree to his proposal. So early on in October, on the 7th, Lenin returned to Petrograd in disguise. You can see him here wearing his wig. And he returned there to persuade the Central Committee in person. So on the 10th of October, Lenin came out of hiding to address the Bolshevik Central Committee. And he used all of his powers of persuasion to try and win them over to his demand to take power immediately. When the committee voted, it voted by a margin of 10 votes to two to take power before elections to the Constituent Assembly. In other words, the committee backed Lenin's demand to take power immediately. However, and this is really important, the committee did not set any specific date for that takeover and did not actually set down any specific plans for the takeover of power at this point. Trotsky played a key role here because he actually urged Lenin to wait for the first All-Russia Congress of Soviets on the 26th of October. Now, remember, every single town and city across Russia has its own Soviet elected by the workers. It's not just the Petrograd Soviet, the Moscow Soviet, there are Soviets in every major town and city. On the 26th of October, representatives from all of those Soviets would come to Petrograd and take part in this, the first All-Russia Congress of Soviets. There would effectively be elected representatives from all across Russia at that meeting. And Trotsky wanted uh, Lenin to wait for that meeting before taking power. Why? Because he wanted Lenin to get the backing of the All-Russia Congress of Soviets. If they did this, it would look like the Bolsheviks had taken power in the name of the Soviet. It would make their takeover look democratic, backed by the people, and therefore legitimate or rightful. At this meeting of the Bolshevik Central Committee, another key feature worth noting is that there was strong opposition to Lenin coming from Kamenev and Zinoviev. Now these two were less radical in their view of revolution than Lenin. In fact, in many ways, they were closer to the Mensheviks. They believed that now was not the right time for a socialist revolution in Russia. And they clashed with Lenin at the meeting. They opposed him. And after the meeting, they published an open letter. That means they actually published their opposition to Lenin in the Bolshevik press and they warned him against seizing power. Here's a clip of what they wrote. If we take power now and are forced into a revolutionary war, then the mass of the soldiers will not support us. In other words, Kamenev and Zinoviev warned Lenin that taking power now would lead to some form of civil war. And in that civil war, the Bolsheviks would not have the backing of the soldiers. Now, this fear played heavily on the minds of all the Bolshevik leaders at this point. Even Lenin and Trotsky feared that they would not have the support of the soldiers and the workers of Petrograd if they took power. And that's worth bearing in mind as we see how this develops further. Now, by printing their open letter to Lenin, Kamenev and Zinoviev increased Kerensky's fears that a Bolshevik takeover was about to happen. 
Kerensky takes preemptive action. He orders the most radical army units of the Petrograd garrison, he orders them out of the city. He knows that those units of the garrison have sympathies towards the Bolsheviks and he does not want them in the city if a Bolshevik takeover is about to happen. However, by ordering the soldiers out of the city, Kerensky unwittingly played into the Bolsheviks' hands. Ordering soldiers to leave the city led to rumours that Kerensky was about to abandon the city and the Soviet to the Germans. And that gave the Soviet, which remember is under Bolshevik control at this point, it gave the Soviet a reason to set up its own Military Revolutionary Committee, or MRC, to defend the city. And that MRC was dominated by Bolsheviks. There were a couple of left SRs, but it was dominated by Bolsheviks. And it was led by Trotsky. Lenin himself is not a member of the Military Revolutionary Committee, but Trotsky is. And through the MRC, Trotsky now had direct control over the Petrograd garrison, their weapons and their ammunition. This effectively meant that the Bolsheviks were now physically able to launch their takeover of power. Now the MRC takes its first steps on the 22nd of October when it mobilises the Bolshevik Red Guards for action. It was clear by this point that a Bolshevik takeover was imminent. No date had yet been set, but it's clear that a Bolshevik takeover is going to happen. However, at this point, Lenin, Trotsky and the other Bolshevik leaders are quite cautious in the actions that they take. And that caution comes from the fact that they're still not sure whether the workers and the soldiers would support their takeover of power, or would they back the provisional government. The following day, on October the 23rd, Kerensky made another miscalculation. He tried to take action against the Bolsheviks. He shut down two of their newspapers and he tried to restrict the power of the MRC. He also raised the bridges linking the working class districts of the city to the centre of Petrograd. That looked like he was trying to stop the workers coming into the city centre to defend the Soviet. Now Kerensky was hoping to prevent a Bolshevik takeover, but his actions backfired. To workers and soldiers, it looked like Kerensky was preparing to attack the Soviet. Remember, Kerensky has form for that. He had already been involved in one counter-revolution with General Kornilov. So to workers, it looks like Kerensky is preparing to attack and close the Soviet. The Bolsheviks were therefore able to justify their takeover. So we could say that Kerensky triggered the Bolshevik uprising. So the following day, on October the 24th, Trotsky and Sverdlov meet at the Bolshevik headquarters, the Smolny Institute in Petrograd. They meet to organise and plan the takeover of power. At this point, even at this late stage, Bolshevik leaders, including Lenin and Trotsky, were nervous about this and rather gloomy about their chances of success. With hindsight, we know that the Bolshevik takeover succeeded, but at that point, Bolshevik leaders had no idea that it would work. In fact, 
they were concerned that the provisional government, Kerensky, would be able to crush their takeover with loyal troops. The takeover itself doesn't begin until later that evening. So in the early hours of the morning, on the 25th of October, Bolshevik forces seized key buildings in Petrograd, with almost no fighting at all. There are a few scuffles when they capture the Telegraph building, the centre of communications, but aside from that, the Bolshevik takeover in Petrograd is pretty much bloodless. The provisional government's troops just fade away when the Red Guard appears. They are not willing to fight for the provisional government. So as dawn breaks and the city wakes up, it's almost impossible to tell that a takeover of power has happened because there's been no real fighting. Kerensky fled the city, leaving behind the provisional government in the Winter Palace. And they did have some defences. They had a couple of units of Cossacks and a woman's death battalion. And the Cossacks spend much of the day grumbling that they have to fight alongside women with guns. As the day wears on, by evening, many of these soldiers are drunk, they're panicking, they're nervous. Many of them have slipped away quietly. Bolsheviks, however, don't arrive until much later. They're delayed by their own problems and their own hesitation. So they don't, uh, they don't actually arrive at the Winter Palace until much, much later. The Bolsheviks make their move on the Winter Palace in the early hours of the morning on the 26th of October. At 2 a.m., a handful of Bolsheviks arrive at the Winter Palace and they arrest the provisional government. Now, this is not a glorious battle for the Winter Palace. A few Bolsheviks, members of the Red Guard, effectively show up at the palace, slip in through the back entrance, and they find the provisional government ministers sat in the dark, hiding, and they arrest them. Later that day, the All-Russian Congress of Soviets gathers in the city. Trotsky arrives at the meeting and he announces that the Bolsheviks have taken power in the name of the Soviet. Now this is really important. The Bolsheviks attempted to disguise their takeover as a Soviet takeover. They knew that the workers, soldiers and peasants wanted Soviet rule. So they, they go to great lengths to disguise their takeover as a Soviet takeover, not as a Bolshevik takeover, a Soviet takeover. When Trotsky announces this, the moderate socialist parties storm out of the meeting. I'm talking here about most of the SRs and the Mensheviks. In their view, remember, this is not the time for a socialist revolution. They are not committed to the idea of taking power. So they storm out of the room. And as they go, Trotsky jeers at them and tells them, shouts after them, that they're, they're walking into the dustbin of history. Only the left SRs remain in the meeting alongside the Bolsheviks. Remember, the left Rs are the more radical wing of the Socialist Revolutionary Party. They throw their lot in with the Bolsheviks here. And that's important because it leaves the Bolsheviks with a majority in the Congress. So the All-Russian Congress of Soviets backs the Bolshevik takeover, thus allowing the Bolsheviks to present this as a Soviet takeover. Lenin arrives later that evening to form a new government, a Bolshevik-led 
government. Having looked at the defining events of the period of dual power, we can discern four factors which account for the Bolsheviks' success in October of 1917. Firstly, the weaknesses of the provisional government. There were limits on what the provisional government could do because real power was held by the Soviet. It saw itself as a temporary body without the authority to make decisions for the long-term future of Russia, such as land reform. And divisions between the liberals and socialists, for example over the war and the land question, led to a lack of clear and decisive policies. Secondly, the policies of the provisional government itself. The early political reforms undermined its own power and allowed radicals the freedom they needed to operate. Continuing the war, as we've seen, created a great deal of opposition and was the root cause of many of the provisional government's other problems. The lack of land reform created a rift between the provisional government and the peasantry. The lack of social and economic reform contributed to the workers' increasing radicalism. And failing to call the Constituent Assembly early enough gave the Bolsheviks a window of opportunity in which they managed to seize power. Thirdly, mistakes by Kerensky. His decision to launch a new offensive against Germany in June caused a great deal of bad feeling towards the provisional government and ultimately triggered an uprising against it. The Kornilov affair discredited him, discredited him with all social classes and also lost him the support of army officers, meaning that he could not rely on them to defend the provisional government when the Bolsheviks launched their takeover. Finally, he underestimated the Bolsheviks, and by moving against them in October, he gave them an excuse to launch their takeover. Lastly, Lenin and the Bolsheviks themselves. They were alone among the socialist parties in opposing the provisional government instead of cooperating with it, and that allowed them to present themselves as an alternative. Their radical policies on the war, land and economy were in tune with the workers, soldiers and peasants' increasingly radical goals. Some historians have pointed to the superior organisation and discipline of the Bolshevik party, and the role played by Lenin himself and the decisions he took personally on policy and strategy. We should also remember Trotsky's role in delaying the takeover of power so that it coincided with the All-Russian Congress of Soviets and organising the takeover itself through the MRC. Lastly, we might also remember that the Bolshevik support was concentrated among soldiers and workers around the two most important revolutionary centres of the country, Petrograd and Moscow. Recent research on the Bolshevik success, carried out by historians such as Professor Edward Acton, has focused on the actions and aspirations of ordinary Russians and the rank and file members of the Bolshevik party. This research has provided us with useful evidence to understand why the Bolsheviks succeeded. Firstly, the ordinary peasant soldiers and sailors had their own rational goals. They, just, they did not just act chaotically and destructively, but they had rational goals they were aiming for. Now, initially, these were things like land reform, economic and social reform. But from May onwards, peasant soldiers and sailors came to understand that in order to achieve these reforms, there had to be substantial political change first. In other words, the removal of the provisional government and its replacement with the Soviet. The Bolsheviks, therefore, cannot be given credit for radicalising the masses. The masses had their own goals. However, the Bolsheviks did offer policies which reflected those goals and won support. The key issue appears to have been the issue of Soviet power, which was widely supported by workers, soldiers and peasants. They wanted Soviet rule, and that explains why there was so little resistance to the takeover in October of 1917, which, remember, was done under the cover of Soviet rule. Meanwhile, the Bolshevik party itself was highly democratic. The membership increased significantly as workers, soldiers and sailors joined, and those groups who joined the party exerted pressure on the leadership 
they didn't just do what the leadership told them to do, they exerted their own pressure on their leaders. And that actually helped Lenin to take the party in a more radical direction. This recent research has also challenged the notion that the Bolshevik party was incredibly organised. Now, there's no doubt the party was better organised than its rivals, but it was not highly organised and highly disciplined. Orders from the centre were often ignored by the local party branches if they weren't in tune with the public mood in those areas. Rather than being a disadvantage, this was actually an advantage to the party because it made the party very flexible. It meant that the party was able to adapt its messages and its policies to suit local conditions. And although Lenin had the greatest prestige within the party and was the foremost leader, his control of the party was somewhat more limited than historians previously thought. He faced a great deal of opposition from the other members of the Central Committee. And actually Trotsky's input in delaying the takeover of power to coincide with the all-Russian Congress of Soviets was significant to the Bolsheviks' relatively smooth seizure of power. Now, taking into account everything that you know and this recent research, it's worth pausing here and reflecting and using what you know to place these four key factors which caused the success of the Bolsheviks into some kind of hierarchy of importance. If you're willing to take this further, here are four examples of likely exam essay questions which you could have a go now at planning and writing. Thanks for watching the tutorial. Remember, there are plenty more tutorials on our YouTube channel.